Now the main purpose of class number three is going to be to not only write out our website content, this won't necessarily be for the entire site though, it's basically gonna be for everything except for our advertising pages. And then we're gonna get this information published on our site. So I'm gonna be walking you guys through this today, beginning with a content writing overview, where I'm actually gonna be discussing my personal approach to writing content, whether or not I have previous knowledge about the subject. And then I'm gonna proceed on to talk about specific pages within this site design. My home page, my about page, the main category pages, and then info pages of my site. I tend to kind of approach each of these pages in a different manner, and so I've kind of broken all this down for you. So in case you have any issues with getting your content created, maybe you're not quite sure what you should be writing about or how to write it, hopefully I will be answering all of those questions with this training today. Then we're going to end it off by doing a little bit of minor polishing on our site, tidying up our menus, and finally enabling search indexing. So once we have some content on our site, we're gonna open the floodgates and let Google in so we can start getting traffic to it. So to start with, I wanna talk about content writing in general, and then get a little more specific in terms of what you should be doing as far as writing your content for these Amazon sites that you're building. The first thing I wanna talk about is content research. Now, if you already have a lot of knowledge about a subject, you may not need to do any research at all. However, you'll likely reach a point in site building where you want to target something that you really don't have any personal knowledge about. And so you're kind of forced to go out and learn this stuff for yourself to truly be able to write useful content that you can put on your site. Now, if you do not already know about the subject and you do have to do this extra research. There are really a lot of ways that you can accomplish this. Obviously, Google should be your best friend when you're doing research. Simply go out and look up information that's already out there about the subject. You can sometimes see from reading through content on other pages where maybe they didn't go far enough or give enough detail about a particular subject, and you can kind of expand on those areas. So in a lot of ways, you can end up rehashing what's already out there, but doing it in a more useful and constructive way than other people have done it. And you can actually beat those people out in the search rankings by even having the same information as them. Obviously, you would not want to be copying any content during this process. You want to be learning the content. Amazon is also a really good tool. Just like you use Amazon in the beginning with niche research and going and learning about specific products, you can do the same thing when you're learning about your niche. I really like to use the customer question and answer and also the customer review sections to truly learn about the product and what people are hoping that it's gonna do for them and what things it has actually been able to do for people. This kind of information really can give you a lot of great starting points for your own content writing, especially if you're not really quite sure what you should be talking about. Now, I also recommend 
to focus on useful content. While it is good to present facts to people, you want it to be done in a way that kind of makes sense th to them. Something that kind of hits home and makes it feel like this was written for them in their particular situation. So I like to try to get personal whenever possible, give stories about myself, talk about my experiences and things of that nature. And also I try to be specific. Not only will this help you out with search rankings because you will explain subjects more thoroughly, but when you talk about specific situations, instead of just being vague about it, you're using all of this extra keyword content that normally wouldn't be there if you did a vague article as opposed to a more specific article. Now, just to give you a brief example here of what I'm talking about, Here is one particular article that I've prepared for my website. This is going to be geared towards gaming and how it can be faster using solid state hard drives. Now, I'm not a crazy gaming fanatic, but I do like to play a game every now and again. And I have a fairly powerful work computer because the things I do for work on my computer are uh, pretty taxing and they don't normally work out very good when you try to do it on a standard retail computer, at least not to the extent that uh, I will often do things. So I have a bit of an advantage there. It's nice to have that. Even though I do it for work purposes, it also translates to the gaming world. And even though I'm not a crazy gaming fanatic, I know there's a lot of other people out there like me that may just like to play an occasional game in their free time. And they would like for it to actually run well. There might be specific problems. They might wait forever for things to load up. And so I talk about this kind of stuff in my article. I get specific. I talk about my own upgrades that I was doing, why I was doing them, the kind of benefits that I was able to see as a result. And I even get specific and actually mention a uh, more modern game that's actually not even technically released yet. It's an early access game, but it's uh, extremely popular. And as a result, Things like these specific mentions of games or operating systems or video editing software that I'll be talking about throughout different articles on this website, those things help to bring me extra keyword traffic because people will go out and search for information that is specific to those software titles. So you can not only help to connect people to what it is that you're talking about and make them feel like this is going to work for them because you give so much information about your own situation that they can kind of visualize it applying to them and they feel a lot more confident with trusting your advice on the products that you're going to recommend and obviously proceeding on to making a sale in the end as well. I'm going to get into talking about this content in a little more detail here as we proceed on. I want to go ahead and move on to my next point though, which is to include extra content. You could obviously fill a page with nothing but a solid article like what you see here. However, there are all kinds of additional types of content besides just plain text that you can include in a website. And you really don't need a lot of technical experience or anything special to be able to do this type of stuff. I'm talking about taking a larger article and 
breaking it up so when it is viewed on your web page, it's not overwhelming to somebody. It doesn't appear as though it is a long, never-ending article. You have things like different headers throughout your article. You can see one of these right here in mine, and they kind of proceed on as I go. Every couple of paragraphs or so, I might have a different header that helps to break up my content into more meaningful pieces. Not only is this helpful for the people that are reading your content, but it's helpful for search engines that you're wanting to get this traffic from too. Other stuff like quoting either people or even other websites can be extremely useful, especially when there is some kind of a well-known weight to that person's name and or the website. For example, if you have a site that is promoting tech-based products, you can go out and find the biggest tech reviewing website or company that exists out there, and you can quote what their reviews are, give a little uh, snapshot of some of the text that they have said, or even just quote the rankings that they assign to these different products. All that kind of stuff, especially when you are giving credit where it is due to these people and websites, that kind of stuff is completely legitimate and also helps to make your site more useful ultimately. Other things like important links. It is quite okay to link out to another website, as long as it is done in moderation and it is highly relevant to your content. I have often found myself linking out to another relevant site or maybe to an informational page, something like Wikipedia, where I know the person is likely not going to end up making a purchase there but that extra information that I'm directing them to can be extremely useful. So you're not only helping people once again that are reading your site, but search engines look at this kind of stuff too. They will look at the sites that you are linking to and look for some kind of a relevancy factor there. And so you can actually improve the relevancy of yours by linking up with relevant sites that are well respected by Google. Other things that are pretty simple to do, things like adding images into your articles, creating lists. This can be simple bullet points or numbered lists that are describing a, a series of steps that somebody might need to take in order to accomplish something. Other stuff like videos, whether it's a video you've created yourself or videos that you go out and find on YouTube, for example. You can embed this kind of stuff into your articles to make them much more useful, more relevant to your topic. So beyond just writing, I would encourage you to think about these different aspects and consider what you can add to your article to spice it up a little bit, to make it a little more interesting and appealing and even to make it more comprehensive to where people are more inclined to trust what you have to say about whatever it is that you're talking about. Going back to that uh, tech example where maybe you quote a uh, well-known company's review. Let's say you're building a site about video games and maybe you quote IGN or something like that and simply list you know, what they have rated that particular title, nine out of 10 stars or whatever the case may be. Then when people see that, and they also see your own review, when you say it's good, they're less inclined to think that it's a biased opinion. When you're quoting other people claiming essentially the same or a similar thing as you, then they're kind of less inclined to go out and try to hunt down that information for themselves. So they're a little more inclined to then focus on your information and take it as fact. Now the other thing that you want to be focusing on 
beyond your writing and making sure you're including extra content along with it is making sure that it's gonna be easy to read for people. You wanna check your spelling and also grammar. If English happens to not be your primary language, try to find a friend that does speak it very well. And if nothing else, see if they can just take a quick read through the articles that you write and maybe just point out particular areas that don't read well or maybe should be rephrased slightly. This kind of stuff can really go a long way, especially if you are targeting uh, an American audience, for example. Now, when it comes to how you're gearing your content for search engine rankings, I have this listed down at the bottom instead of up at the top of my list for a very specific reason. This should honestly be less of a focus for you until you have basically completed an article. Then go back through it and ask yourself if you have these different parts to it. If you have used your primary keyword that you're trying to target with uh, that particular pa page, you wanna make sure that you are using it. However, you don't want to be overusing it. And I feel like whenever people are told you wanna target one article to a specific keyword phrase, when they're writing out that article, they're a little more focused on that keyword targeting. And so they tend to repeat the keyword phrase over and over again. And you kind of end up with keyword spam as a result instead of a useful article that is actually about your subject. Now, another thing that I recommend to do that uh, both of these things kind of tie into one another really is using semantic words and also checking keyword density. I wanna show you some actual examples of this. So this will make a little bit more sense. Let's say I am targeting the phrase solid state drive. If I wanted to find what Google might consider to be semantic words for this particular keyword phrase, I can actually use a little bit of a keyword density trick where I search for the phrase itself. And then I go through for each of the different pages that are listed in those results I essentially strip all of the content out of those pages and analyze them to figure out what are the more commonly used words. And more importantly, what words are used besides the primary keyword phrase that I'm trying to target. Those other words are gonna end up being your semantic keyword phrases. Now, obviously this is not a perfect surefire way there are a lot of other ranking factors that go in besides simply the content that is on the page. However, this is also why I take a bit of a sampling of a number of sites instead of just one to try to get a more accurate picture of that kind of thing. So I wanna show you how I actually do this. So you can do this for your own articles as well. I first go and search for the phrase keyword density. This takes you to uh, the number one result here is a site called seobook.com and they have this free keyword density analyzer tool. I actually like to use this to analyze the density of articles that I write. You can uh, click on plain text here and paste your articles in. You can also provide a list of website addresses here and it will go and analyze those websites for you. So I can go in and for example look at 
the Wikipedia page. I can copy the link that is for it. Sorry, I don't want to copy the Google link. I want to go to the page and get the actual link for that. And then I'm going to come back here and punch it into the keyword density analyzer. Now, the one thing I like to change is the minimum word length. I like to change this to one just so I can see all of the one word phrases that are being used too and what their densities might be. So I just click on submit now and this will take a look at that page for me and all of the keywords that are contained on it. I probably gave it a pretty big page to take a look at. Yeah, that was 12,000 words that I had to analyze there. As you can see though, when I analyze this page, I can see important things that are being talked about that relate to my subject matter. Beyond solid state drive, I have SSD and SSDs, obviously the abbreviation for solid state drive here. Other common words, drives, data, memory, flash, storage, disk, performance. When I go over to the two and the three word phrases, it gives me a different picture of what might be, might, may be uh, actually discussed in that content. For example, flash memory. I had memory and flash that were in some of the most commonly used words here, but when I see that they're also commonly used together, it's a pretty good indication that this has something to do with your subject matter, especially then if you go and you run this same type of analyzing on additional pages that are ranked for that same keyword. If you go through and run the top five pages or even the top 10 pages and compare the results that you're getting from all of them, you're going to see some common phrases that pop up on all of them. And I could pretty much guarantee for solid state drive that flash memory would be one of them. However, if I did not know about this subject ahead of time, I might not know anything about flash memory. I might not know that it was related to a solid state drive. So I can find out some things here that maybe I need to go and research further and figure out, okay, how does this connected and what can I talk about on my site relating to this subject and you know connecting it to my primary subject. So all these different phrases, form factors, hard disk, flash memory, I could likely go a little further down and find additional ones. PCI Express, Linux Kernel, Tom's Hardware is actually a popular uh, tech review website, operating system, memory cards, there's all kinds of phrases in here. You do sometimes have to look for them a little bit, but it's uh, really pretty easy to find them in this manner. So the whole point here of finding these different semantic words is to essentially make sure that you are using them within your content and maybe to even give you some additional ideas if uh, you find yourself lacking in content on a particular article. You can find out some semantic phrases and you can have a couple paragraphs talking about that particular subtopic. Now the same thing I've done here for other pages that are already in the Google rankings. You can also do this for your own writing too. However, I would encourage you to not get too fixated on trying to hit certain percentages or anything like that with your own writing. Just as an example though, if I use this same article once again, 
and copy my article. Take it over to this site and paste in my text. I can analyze the information that I have in my article. So I can see how frequently I might have used my target keywords. In this one, my target keyword has something to do with games and gaming, computers and solid state drive. So I do have a healthy mix of each of these target phrases in my article, but there's really no one phrase that is overwhelming all of the other ones. Some people will try to go for upwards of 5% keyword density for whatever their target keyword phrase may be. But I really feel like you don't have to have your target keyword phrase as the number one phrase on your entire website for Google to actually respect it. Your phrase simply needs to be there and somewhat, somewhat prevalent. So I like to try to see whatever my target phrase is, maybe in the top 10 or so of the phrases that are ranking up here. And I like to see the density stay pretty low. Um, I've actually seen my best results with um, 2% and even 1% keyword densities for target keyword phrases. And I, kind of go for uh, 500 to 1,000 words, give or take, with any given article that I write. But if there is a lot more content than that that's gonna fit your subject, by all means, you know, write a 2,000 or 3,000 word article. The previous search that I did here for solid state drive on Google, the number one article there had 12,000 words. So you can see how Google does indeed respect articles that are a lot higher in word count. There's a lot more content that they can index and there's a lot more of these semantic words that are gonna end up being used. And this does help to drive up the rankings. Wikipedia is not invincible. If they don't have a page of good content, they're not gonna rank up there, and it's actually possible to beat them. I've beat Wikipedia on quite a few rankings by offering more content than they actually have because they're not as um, all-inclusive as you know they would really like to be. There's plenty of subject matters where they're lacking on. Now with that said, I want to proceed on to talking about something more specific here. We're going to go into the home page to begin with. And I first want to talk about the content of this home page itself. On the home page here, you can see that I have a number of different sections of content. I really kind of recommend making home pages in pretty much the same way on a lot of the sites that I end up building. And so I've broken down this format that I use. To start with, I like to introduce people to my website what my content on the site is going to be about and essentially what the overall purpose of this site really is going to be. I kind of limit this to just a couple of paragraphs worth of content. The reason why I don't put too horribly much content up at the top is because the parts that are coming next, these next two sections here, this one and also this one, are for the primary categories that I'm gonna be covering on my site. And so I want people to be able to see these easily when they first land on my webpage. 
because ultimately I want them to proceed on through my site through one of these two sections if they do come to my site through my homepage. So with that said, these two sections here I have described below. One is the info category intro and the other is the product category intro. Now for my site, I have grouped all of my content into two main categories here. This is my list that I have been working on throughout this series and I have my brands that are going to be my product pages and then I have my info which is more my informational based articles. If you happen to have more than two category groupings here though, you would have more than two intros. So however many categories you end up having on your site, that's how many different intro sections you would want to be creating on your homepage. For each of these intro sections, you're gonna need a title. You can see right here, I have a little header going with each of these sections that is my title. And then you're also gonna need a description. The description should really be a summary of that entire section and also maybe a little bit of a uh, teaser and a call to action. You want people to have a reason to click on it. And so this kind of helps if you get a little specific, at least briefly mention a few specific things that you have going on in this category. So people that are interested in that information, if they see this being talked about, they will quickly go and uh, take a look at that section of your site. Now you also wanna have a picture to go along with each of these main categories. Now the picture that you use is not crazy important. You don't have to go all out. You don't have to hire somebody to get these pictures created for you. If you have some of these products yourself or can take pictures of maybe not just the products but maybe the products in use, these can certainly be great pictures to use for the home page. Something that essentially will kind of summarize what the whole category is about with a single picture. So for solid state drive brands, I'll put up something like a picture of a solid state drive. For the one where I'm gonna be talking about solid state drives and what they are and how they can help speed up computers in a variety of different situations, uh, my initial thoughts were to show uh, the internals of a solid state drive there. Cause I'm gonna kinda be getting into essentially talking about the internals of it all in there. So these pictures can come from a wide variety of different places. You can go out to Google and search for pictures that are already out there. They have settings on Google where if I were to search for solid state drive, for example, and I then go to images, initially all the images that are being shown to me could potentially be free to use or they might be copyrighted images. Now, 99 times out of 100, if you just randomly choose a picture here, chances are you're not gonna run into any issues. You're never gonna hear from these sites saying, hey, you're using my picture, I want you to take it down. But if that kind of thing were to happen, that's honestly exactly what they would do. They would try to contact you and just say, hey, this is my picture. You know, we own the rights to this. Please remove it from your site. You respond back saying, no problem. We've removed it down. You've sent a link back to your site showing that it's gone. I have randomly pulled pictures off of here before. And from doing this kind of stuff, uh, building websites in general for uh, give or take two decades now, I've never once received any kind of a contact about anything of that nature. However, with that said, 
if you want to be absolutely sure and just not even possibly worry about that kind of thing, you do have options over here in the little gearbox. If you click this icon, you have advanced search options. And one of these options all the way down at the bottom is usage rights. You can actually change this to a variety of different options. Free to use or share even commercially, free to use or share or modify even commercially. These two are really the ones that you would want to go for. If you're planning on just reusing it as it is, this one works. If you want to make changes to the image and then reuse it however you see fit, this would be the one you want. So just as an example, if I change this, I get a different set of pictures, but give or take on a lot of different subjects that you go out and search, there are still tons of available images, even if you do refine it down and remove the ones that are not specifically labeled for reuse, because that is what these are showing up here. It is possible something could show up here and maybe it's not truly supposed to be here if it gets labeled incorrectly, but that would not be uh, your fault essentially. You can go into each individual site and look and see if they have any specific legal terminology talking about reuse of their images. Um, sites like Wikipedia actually allow the reuse of any images that they have there. So you can even go to Wikipedia itself and try to find pictures that you could use on your site. Right here, uh, the top number of images actually look to all be Wikipedia based. This one right here is not, but all the rest of them on the top two lines are all Wikipedia or Wikimedia, one of those different types of uh, sites there. So there are tons of images out there and this is in addition to what you can already find on Amazon. It's also okay to reuse the Amazon images that you find for specific products. So I could go and search for a specific solid state drive and download one of these pictures to use on my site. However, you do want to be sure that you are actually promoting whatever product it is that you decide to reuse. Because that's kind of um, the one bit of gray area there with using an image off of Amazon. They do allow affiliates to reuse them, but you're supposed to be essentially reusing them as part of your promotional material, not necessarily just freely reusing any images that are available on Amazon. So with that said, if you do go to Amazon and find something you want to use and you know you're going to be promoting this product, you can certainly go and uh, save the image to your own computer. I like to get descriptive with my naming and name it based on the actual product or include relevant keyword phrases in the naming of whatever it is that I'm uh, saving here for my image. So with these images, the final thing that we need to have is a link. And this is actually why we created placeholder pages previously, because we have something to link up to instead of having to essentially build our site backwards. If you don't set up placeholder pages and stuff ahead of time, you pretty much have to create all of your posts or at least some of your posts first and then work backward to your category pages and then work backward to your home page. Well, I like to be able to set it up in a more logical manner. So I simply create the placeholder pages first and then I go out back in and add my content to them. Now the final thing with my home page is a section of content on essentially an expanded introduction. However, here I recommend to get specific. 
Now you can do what I have here on my page and just do a couple paragraphs worth of content. Or you can certainly do a lot more. It just kind of depends on whether or not you are going to be really dependent upon traffic for the primary keyword phrase of your entire site in which case you would definitely want to have a very heavily built up home page, a thousand words, maybe even 2000 words would certainly be uh, useful for you. However, for my site, a lot of my search traffic, I predict will end up coming from my informational keyword phrases that I'm going to target with my info pages. And so I haven't gone too heavily into content for my home page, but I could certainly expand on my topic even more by getting specific once again, talking about things that are going to have a direct appeal to people that are reading your site. Even if this means covering a number of different topics to try to make sure you're hitting everybody separating these topics onto different pages can be a good idea if um, the topics have kind of too much separation between them. But for something like my home page here, I can certainly talk about a number of the different subtopics that I might be covering throughout my site and just kind of give a little bit of introductory information here about them. Now for me, on this site, I actually chose to have this content address something that I ended up not targeting in my keyword phrases, simply to include this information on my site still, but to not have to devote an entire page to this topic. And this topic is uh, downloading speeds online. When you're downloading a large file, Ultimately, the speed of that download is limited by the parts in your computer. You can actually go and buy, if you're in a decent uh, area that has a lot of connection offerings, you can buy a really high speed internet connection. But then when you go and you test your internet connection, if you try to run speed tests on it, you'll find that you really never get what you pay for as far as the uh, potential speed of your connection there. And part of the reason for that is the hardware of your computer can actually limit your downloading speed. And so the hard drive is not the only piece of hardware that could limit that download speed. However, it is a kind of prime culprit of something that could certainly slow it down. Ultimately, your computer is going to have to be able to write the information to your hard drive to be able to save it. It can try to store some of it into RAM and temporary memory, but ultimately it's going to have to go on the hard drive. And so it needs to be able to write that data quickly. And having a solid state hard drive um, significantly increases download speed as long as other hardware factors on your computer are correct. For example, you know, if um, the solid state drive is really the only modern fast piece of hardware on the computer, you know, it might not make that much of an improvement. Um, you would see some improvement, but again, another part of the computer would likely end up bogging it down. So anyways, I talk about how this applies to solid state drives, how it can help people that are worried about this type of thing. So I got specific here. I'm kind of addressing a topic that somebody might even search for that has a direct relation to what my primary keyword phrase is. On the homepage of my site, my primary keyword phrase is actually fastest SSD. You can see it right up here in the first paragraph of my content. I usually do try to include my primary keyword phrase in the first paragraph. But then 
the rest of my content is meant to back that up. So even though I might not still be talking about specifically the fastest solid state hard drive, when I talk about something here, fastest internet download speeds, I'm using phrases that I know are gonna be semantic to my primary topic. And so ultimately, all this content will help to back up my primary subject. So with that said, I'm now going to go ahead and add my homepage onto my website. I simply go into pages and edit my existing placeholder page. You'll know you're on the right one because it'll say up in the permit link that it's just pointing to the domain. There's no actual page address for your homepage once you set that up in WordPress. So I want to take my text content and copy it into my page so I can then begin to work on it. I want to point out a couple of things though. Number one, the way I initially did this, if you see here the formatting that's taking place, the fact that I'm getting a blank line in between each one here. This is actually happening because of Notepad. And this is likely something that you'll run into if you do use something like Notepad because in order to be able to see all of the text that you're writing, you're likely gonna have word wrap turned on. Well, when you copy and paste content using word wrap, it actually changes the way it gets put into your final page here. Just to show you what I'm talking about, I've disabled word wrap now, and I'm gonna paste back in one more time. You can see how it still wraps, just like it was doing before, except the spacing and the formatting of everything is more in line with what I have in my original here. Stuff like that drove me crazy early on uh, using WordPress, so I wanted to be sure to point that out to you. So now, once I have my content into my homepage, my next step is to connect this homepage with my category pages. My category pages are represented by these two sections of content here one of them for my informational category and the other one for my product or brand category. So what I wanna do is to actually add links and images to these two different sections here. So to start with, I'm gonna go ahead and add a couple images. I just simply go to add media within the WordPress editor. I select upload files, and then I can actually choose the pictures that I wanna upload. And you can do more than one of them at a time and upload them all together. Now, as far as inserting them, wherever you have your cursor in the editor is where those images will get put into your content. So if you don't wanna to have to worry about copying and moving code around and stuff like that, click in front of one of your headers here. Add your image in. This could either be something you're uploading right now or something you previously uploaded. Then click on your image. Down below here, we have two main things that we want to pay attention to. We have the alignment. For my site, I'm going to leave this set on left alignment. I think this works best and looks the best with this particular arrangement that I'm going to be doing here. And then down below where it says link to, 
I want to change this from media file to custom URL. Now the reason why I'm doing this is because normally when you insert an image into WordPress like this, you're only going to be showing a thumbnail of that image. You can see what the size of that thumbnail will end up being right here. Well, when somebody clicks on that thumbnail, with the default setting of media file, they will be taken to see the full size of that image. Well, on my site, for this particular setup, I want these images to point to a category page instead of the full size image. So that's why I need to provide a custom URL in. Now the actual URL that I provide is gonna be for my category pages. These are the actual pages that I am creating for them, not, um, not the post categories. So these are my custom category pages that I have redirected from the default category system in WordPress. So I want the full URL of these pages right here. If you hover over the view link on these pages, you can actually simply copy the link location straight from there. And then so for this one here, faster PCs, I can click on add media. I select the image that I wanna be using. I have it on left alignment. And for the custom URL, I simply just paste in that link that I just copied. Then I can insert it into my page. So now I'm gonna do the same thing again with the second image. This one here is pointing to my brands category and I will again insert that into my page. Now one of the things that I like to modify about these images, I tried to avoid this kind of stuff as much as I possibly could. Technically you could ignore this one tiny little step here if the coding is confusing, but actually tried to completely ignore coding in this training series to make it really easy to apply no matter what your experience level might be, but to still have it just as powerful as any other methods that I've ever used to create websites. So this one minor adjustment here is found in the image code. Look for the words WP image, and it's gonna have a number out on the end of it. Just simply delete that phrase and the extra space that goes with it. This will be on any image that you insert from WordPress. What this is doing, I'll leave one of these on real quick just so you can see. Doesn't want to let me preview that for some reason. What's going on here is that it's not showing up. It generally adds um, a border to the image. I know it does it with Weaver Extreme. Um, I've even done some tests on this exact website and have seen it. Anyways, for some reason it's not showing up on this one. But uh, when you have this little WP image with the number as part of the uh, class code here, this actually adds a border around the image. And a lot of times I'll simply be looking to just add the clean image to my page without the border around it. So if you do see the border and you wanna get rid of it, this is what you're looking for. Simply delete that little part of text. However, um, at least with this particular example, it's uh, not affecting that image for some reason. So you might be able to leave it in place, or you might not. Regardless, it's still worth pointing out because the borders on those images 
was another thing that kind of drove me crazy early on when it just maybe didn't fit with the design that I was trying to go for. Now the next thing that I want to do is to turn these two sections right here into more of a clickable area. Currently, only my image is clickable, where if I click on the image, I'm taken to that subsection of my website. Well, I want this to stand out a little bit more and want it to be more obvious that people can indeed be clicking here to proceed on to another section of my website. One of the ways that I accomplish this is by simply changing how some of this text ends up getting displayed. In particular, the little header title that you have to go along with each of these sections. So you can see the border showing up here. It might just be my sub theme that I picked perhaps in Weaver that prevents the borders from showing. Anyways, you select a header here for one of your sections. And then if you go up to paragraph, you can change these to a number of different settings to get various sizes. I find header two to work out pretty good for this one. However, if you have your text set up, kind of how I have mine set up initially where the header is one line directly above the text like this, you get the entire next paragraph sometimes being uh, put into that header as well. One of the things that you can do to avoid this is to simply add a blank line before switching that header over. However, if you have already done it on accident like this, you can then add your blank line, select all the bold text that's not supposed to be the header, and just change it back to a standard paragraph and it'll bump that up in line. So now I'm getting a little closer to what I am trying to go for here, but I'm still not quite there yet. I need to add in a couple of links now. Number one, I want the header to be a link. And again, this is gonna be pointing to the same place that we have our image pointing to. So if you select your header text and click on the insert edit link button, you can then link up to other content. And if need be, you can actually go down below here, find that content and easily add your link on. So you wanna do the same thing for both of your header titles. I just realized I picked the wrong link for this one. So now we have a little more closer to what I'm going for. I have an image. I have a larger header title that definitely stands out more. And then both the image and the header title are now clickable for me. Now, one thing that is kind of optional to do is to add on an additional text link to the very end of it, where you can say something like read more Although I kind of feel like read more, continue reading, things like that are kind of a little more geared towards single articles as opposed to entire sections of a website. So I might do something like read all info about SSD speed or click to learn about solid state drives, 
for this section, I could say something like, find out about our recommended SSD brands. And then I can actually turn these extra sections of text into clickable links yet again. So I then end up with an image, a title, and some text down at the bottom of my paragraph to help direct people along to these different areas of my site. Now beyond this initial setup for these main categories, other things that I might be doing would be like um, the remaining headers that I have throughout my content, especially down below. I might simply set these with bold text where I select the text and just click on the bold button right here. And this just helps for the headers to kind of stand out from the rest of my page content a little bit more. So once you get to this point, you kind of realize, okay, this is now talking about a different subject and doesn't really go along with one of these two sections here. Now, a couple of things worth pointing out. You may notice here how on one of these categories, I have text that actually runs out past the side of my image down below it here. But on the other one, I don't have that happening. The reason why is simply the amount of text compared to the size of the image. This actually, this image is actually a little bit larger than this one. And the thumbnail ends up being, I think this one's 300 pixels tall as opposed to maybe 200 pixels on this one. So the image itself is not taking up as much space. If you're really picky about something like this, maybe you don't want to see this extra text hanging off to the left here. You can simply find an image that would take up a larger height or you can reduce the amount of text that you are using here. If I were to simply shorten this by essentially this much text right here, it would all fit next to that image without this bit of overflow. Now there are some more complicated ways you could say of um, actually trying to get this work. You can use uh, CSS, for example, to go into an image and actually modify it to um, have it give some extra padding. For example, on this one, I'm where the image is being displayed. If I go right after it and type style equal to margin bottom we'll say 40 pixels. If I were to add in something like this, I should end up with more of a clearance down on the bottom of my image. Yeah, that got rid of one line for me, so I'd have to go a little bit larger than that. If I went 60 or 80 pixels, then I'd end up clearing all this out and it would all fit correctly here. And I just have a little bit of white space left in the bottom. So if you do have a little bit of uh, CSS knowledge and you can you know, add in some simple coding like that to try to correct that issue, that is one way you can go about it. This bit of style code right here. Um, if not though, if you're completely uncomfortable with the coding and you want to avoid, avoid it altogether, Simply pick a larger picture or 
reduce the amount of text content that you have to be associated with that picture. Now beyond the tidying up of this page, and getting the content to look a little bit better, the other main thing that you have for each page are the settings that WordPress allows you to input for the page. This can kind of vary depending on the themes or the plugins that you're using. However, if you do use the exact same software setup that I use, you'll have things like Weaver options down here where you can kind of fine tune specific elements of a page. I have a lot of these things already being hidden based on my theme settings that I had set up last week. Stuff like the info bar, I'm already hiding, so I don't have to hide them on individual pages. Um, other stuff like sidebars, if I wanted a sidebar on a particular page of my site, I can enable it right here. Or maybe if I have sidebars on by default, then here I can go in and disable them on a per page basis if I didn't want them to have sidebars. So certain things down in these options uh, can really be useful for a wide variety of situations. However, there is one section here, the SEO settings, that I would recommend for you to look at no matter what. The SEO settings, in particular, the search engine listing section, is really the most important that you want to worry about. You have a title tag and a meta description here. In most cases, I will end up simply copying the title of my page. For this particular page, I'm actually going to add on my domain to the end of it because this is my home page of my site. And then for my meta description, I want to give a summary of what my page is about. The reason why these two are important is because they can affect search rankings. But most importantly, even if they had no weight on your rankings whatsoever, these two things can help to attract people to click on your search listing in the results. So you want this to be appealing to somebody that's reading it at a quick glance on Google. Think about when you go to Google and you search for something. There are certain things, certain topics that might be essentially the same throughout all the different pages, but you have titles on some of those pages and descriptions on some of those pages that are certainly much more appealing and therefore you're kind of drawn to click on those to kind of find out what they're talking about. So leading people to think that you can answer their questions, but not outright answering it in the description and in the title here by leading them into your website first to essentially get that information is one really great way of doing that. You're kind of leaving a bit to mystery. People like mysteries. They like to figure out what's on the other side of it. And so you can use this to your advantage when you are writing out your title tags and your meta descriptions. This can also apply for the titles that you're creating for the actual pages as well. I kind of briefly talked about that last week when we were uh, setting up these placeholder pages where I'll try to include my primary keyword phrase, at least somewhere in the title. It does not always have to be at the beginning. But then my uh, description is going to elaborate on that. And as you can see, even in my title, I have much more than just my primary keyword phrase. I have other descriptive words that go along with it to emphasize on it to help to possibly make my search listing more appealing for people to click on. So for my description for this home page here, I'll say something like browse my personal 
recommendations for solid state drives. for consumers. Based on my own experiences and usage. So I'm re-emphasizing what my main topic is about. I can maybe even say quick or something like that, fast here, where I'm using the same kind of terminology for what my primary keyword phrase is. Fastest SSD, quick solid state drives essentially means the same thing, but it's in completely different words. Stuff like that, this is what I consider to be at least one example of a semantic word. It could also be a synonym for your keyword phrase. All this kind of stuff is useful when it works in your description and helps to reemphasize your keyword targeting for your pages. So this is something that I make sure that I do on all of my pages. At the very least, setting a title tag and a meta description. You can then provide that same information on the social networks listing page, especially if you end up using some kind of uh, Facebook sharing tool where people can share a post. It'll automatically populate those shared posts with this information. Or if somebody tries to link up to my website on Facebook themselves manually, it will automatically populate with this information here. So yet another reason uh, to be providing this. It can not only help you get people off of search engines, it can help you get people off of social networks as well. So now that I am finished with my content, setting up my initial settings, I can go ahead and update this page now. So now I have the home page of my site where people can advance on to different subsections of my site as well by simply clicking on the image or the title. However, these additional sections have nothing on them so far. So these are actually my next steps, uh, the category pages and also the about page. Now the about page I'm going to be covering first. You can certainly do these pages in a variety of different ways. You don't have to do it the exact way that I recommend for you to do here. But if you have any kind of a personal connection with the niche that you're trying to target, I would recommend trying to go this route where you get personal and tell your story, who you are, what your experiences are, and essentially all this kind of sums up why somebody should really trust what you have to say about this niche. This is the about page content that I have prepared for this About Us page on my Solid State Drive website. You can see up here in the first couple of paragraphs where I talk about myself, the fact that I'm self-employed and work at home and specifically on my computer, so I depend on it. And I've actually made upgrades myself to my computer to fix problems, but also to help to improve performance so I can work more efficiently and effectively. So the fact that this is based off of personal experience should really help to hit home with people 
make them realize, hey, I'm not just creating this site just to try to sell a product to somebody. I have reasons why I'd be saying all this stuff. I have reasons why I prefer a particular product over another or why I think something is more effective because it's based on things I've actually been through myself. And making this connection with uh, people that are reading your website can really go a long way because they aren't ever going to meet you, most likely. So you have to try to connect with them some other way. I also go on to talk about why I created the site, who it's for. So that is what this next section, uh, four different paragraphs here, why I created SpeedySolidStateDrive.com. Obviously, I am promoting products on them. A main reason is to try to earn money off of these affiliate sales. However, the topic still rings true to me personally. I have my own experiences that I've gone through because I've been on the other side of this kind of a situation. I've been the consumer that's looking for that information and I saw the shortfalls essentially in how that information is provided and how people can uh, digest it. And for me to be kind of a techie person, when I see something that I kind of struggle to understand and it's and it's in the techie realm, I know people that do not have a lot of technical knowledge are really going to struggle with it. And so I feel like this presents an opportunity for me to go after this niche, to not only target the niche, but to do it from a unique perspective, something that will actually apply to a lot of people out there. They may not be techie like me, but they can understand the frustration of reading all these technical reviews and ultimately not actually understanding them. Because unless you know all the extra jargon and stuff like that, um, a lot of that stuff can just go straight over your head. And it even does it for me, too, because I'm more of a software guy as opposed to a hardware guy. Now, finally, the last main part here that's really content that you're going to be providing is about the products that you are advertising. You don't have to include, you know, these different sections and this kind of stuff. But I feel like this helps to make people more aware of, you know, why you're actually promoting, what you're promoting, and to, again, to give them some confidence in your recommendations. I could have created a site that promoted every single solid state drive that is out there, and I could say I recommend every single one of them but that just simply wouldn't be truthful. So I narrowed my selection down to the ones that I've, I've actually used myself and then a small selection of some other well-known, highly reviewed products outside of the ones that I've had personal experience with. So. I can still recommend them. They may have been ones that I was considering buying myself and I just ended up picking one brand over another. Or it might be based off of other reviews that I've seen out there where, you know, this product is similar to this one and, you know, there may not really be a superior one of the two. So there are situations like that where I can recommend things that I have not personally tried just based off of the knowledge that I have obtained during my own research when I was trying to figure out what I should be buying for myself, for my computer. And so finally, uh, the very last thing that you want to include on this page is your Amazon affiliate disclaimer. This is where I personally choose to provide this disclaimer on all of my Amazon sites. I've been uh, 
doing this for quite a few years and I've never had any kind of an issue with this being the place where I provide this disclaimer statement. Some people may feel like they want to have it down in the footer of their site and shown on every single page throughout their website. Personally, I choose to um, not do that and just have it on this About Us page that is talking about my site in general. If people want to really find out that information, it is there, and I make it easily accessible. It's up in the uh, top menu bar of my website on every single page, so really easy to get to there. This statement, though, is pretty much the same statement that you're want, going to want to have on any Amazon site that you build. This is a specific requirement of their affiliate agreement. They have this exact statement in there, maybe minus uh, my domain name here. Whatever your site name is, is a participant in the Amazon Services LLC Associates program, an affiliate advertising program designed to provide a means for sites to earn advertising fees by advertising and linking to Amazon.com. Now, if you were linking to a different site, maybe you were doing Amazon UK or Amazon Canada, or maybe even a combination of a couple different Amazon sites, you know, you can expand on the end part here, but for the most part, the ending to it and the beginning of it, where you're talking about specific websites, is really all you have to adjust from one site to the next. This simply helps to keep you in line with their terms of service. Now, I can go and proceed with adding this content. Sometimes I will just call this about, sometimes I'll call it about me, about us, it just kind of depends. Sometimes I'll call it about and then whatever the name of my site is. Ultimately, it's not that important though what you end up calling it. The important parts here though, Our, uh, I did this again, I pasted in the wrong thing. The important parts here is, number one, if you are getting personal with people and introducing yourself and personal experiences of yours, I would recommend that you include a uh, picture of yourself so people can put a name to the face. I'm going to put mine on right alignment here and let it link up to the media media file so people can actually get to that full size picture. The other main thing I'm going to want to do here is go through each of my headers and just simply set them to be bold text. Now out of all the pages on your site, this one is not as important to make sure you have your SEO settings provided because you're not really targeting anything on this page. But you can see right here how this basic setup of a little bit of content, what the site is about, and a personal introduction along with a picture helps to get people to realize that, you know, there's a little more to this site than just being a big collection of articles. It's put together by somebody that has personal experience with these products and, you know, it will make them more inclined to be able to trust your knowledge. You don't have to be a professional in the field either. You can just be a hobbyist, an enthusiast of whatever the subject matter is. You can still even claim that kind of stuff that you're a big fan, a big enthusiast of a particular hobby, for example, if you actually do learn enough about it to truly be able to write useful information for the hobby. But, um, you know, try not to lie, but still 
look for a way to try to make that personal connection with them too. Now, next up, I have my main category pages. Even though today's lesson is not geared towards the uh, product pages of our site, we are going to add a little bit of initial content to the main product category page, simply because we're going to allow search engines to start indexing our site soon, and we don't want them to go to a completely blank page. We at least want something to be there. And then as they re-index that page a couple of additional times over the next couple of weeks, they will see extra content getting added to it. And uh, this can be helpful for a site as well. So the main thing as far as your writing that you want to worry about for a main category page is simply to have a couple paragraphs of introduction content. You really do not need a massive article for the main category pages of your site. The introduction content should basically be a summary of what kind of articles people can expect on this page. These main category pages will all have listings of additional categories that people or additional articles that people can go and read beyond this one. So you're going to have these different summaries or excerpts from those various articles, and that will essentially be the content of your page. So that's why you just need an introduction here and really nothing else. For my introduction content, for my info section, um, I simply talk about this in general terms. I mentioned that there are a lot of different things you can do to try to speed up a computer, but out of all the different hardware upgrades or trying to analyze software and stuff on your computer, different things you can do there to optimize, personally, I really feel like these solid state drives are one of the easiest, if not the easiest, and most effective upgrades that you can actually do to your computer. In addition to that, I talk about how a big drawback to a lot of computer hardware upgrades is a compatibility factor where, for example, if you want to buy more RAM for your computer, you need to know that you have open slots for it. You need to know exactly exactly what size and what type of RAM is compatible with your motherboard. Well, with hard drives, you really don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Unless your computer is 10 or 15 years old or more, a solid state drive will work in it. Uh, the modern ones that they you know currently sell. All internal solid state drives are actually the same size. They're two and a half inches. And that's the size that a laptop will use for its internal hard drive. For desktops, it's three and a half inches, but all you need is a little mounting kit where you mount the smaller drive in this larger metal bracket and you simply install that into your computer. So this right here helps to reemphasize my point to talk about the simplicity of it and I'm kind of trying to encourage people to want to go on and read more about this subject. If they're not quite sure about these solid state drives and whether it's going to be right for them, I want this to kind of hype them up in a way to get them excited about learning more about these solid state drives. Because if I can get them wrapped up into this subject matter, chances are by the time they're done going through all of my info articles, they're going to want to try to buy one of these. They're going to be wondering, you know, what it can do for their own computer. So then I end off with a brief statement saying to read our articles below. I'm basically giving a call to action um, 
telling people maybe a couple of vague but still kind of specific examples of, of what it is that they can expect to find down below. Talking about learning more about solid state drives, choosing the best one for your needs, how to make your computer faster for specific situations. So I don't go into too much detail there, um, but I'm kind of giving people a bit of a teaser, if you will, on what's to come. So they want to continue on down my page and see the rest of it. So now I can add this category page into my website. Now notice, once again, that this is all the content there is. It's just a couple of paragraphs here. The rest of the content on that page will end up coming from my articles that I actually write. So I'm going to go in and edit my category page now. Paste my content in. And I'm actually done with this page now, at least for as far as adding in the uh, content goes. The final thing you really want to do though, besides the content, and this is what helps to connect up the articles to your page, is changing the page template. We're going to change this from default template to page with post, and then we will update our page. Now, before I go into what happens next with that, one last thing I want to mention with these main category pages is the URL of them. In a lot of cases, I will try to keep these URLs of my main category pages as short as I possibly can, one or two words to describe what my category is about. This is my info category. It could also be maybe, um, about speed, it could be about performance or something like that. So, you know, I could have kind of used any of those words. I wanted to do something other than speed or solid state drive for this category name since that already is contained within my domain name. So I chose info. It's fairly basic and not very descriptive for um, this particular case, but Ultimately, I like having the short URLs for my main category pages because it's easier to remember. It's um, if somebody wanted to write that URL down, if it you know contained a number of articles they wanted to be able to come back to later. So it would be something um, pretty easy to get back to instead of a big, long, complicated URL that maybe contains all the words in your title. So with that said, I'm going to update my page now. And once I update my page, I want to scroll down to the bottom of the Weaver Options box. You can see right here, I'm in the Weaver Options box. I'll go all the way down to the bottom here, right up above where the SEO settings are. There's a new section of settings that'll show up here when you change it to a page with post template. And that's gonna be this whole section in here. All of this lets you control how the posts will get displayed at the bottom of this page. So at the very, very least, what you want to do is to provide a category slug. Category slug goes in this box right here. And if you're not quite sure what to be putting there, if you go to post and then to categories, you'll see the categories that you have created. You simply find the category that matches the page that you are creating here and then look for the slug for it. So the slug for this one is simply info. I will copy that and I will put the slug into this box here for category. So this is gonna pull posts that are in the info category and it's gonna put them on this page. So I have redesigned the standard WordPress category page 
made it to where I control the title, I control the content, but I still get the automated listing of the different posts. Now, everything else that goes along with that can be considered optional. However, if you want your post listing to appear a certain way, to be sorted a certain way, there are options down below where you can change up stuff like that pretty easily. For example, um, you can change how the posts are getting displayed. By default, it's gonna show a excerpt of the post along with the title. Well, you can choose title only, title and featured image, so on and so forth. You can also choose whether to display the post in multiple columns. By default, it'll just be in one single column. So they have a number of different options if you do want this to look a particular way. Now my SEO settings down at the bottom are again going to be pretty important for this page. You do want to worry about the SEO settings for everything, maybe except for the About Us page. So I would come down here and provide a description to go along with my title. I can say something like learn about solid state drives from an actual consumer that explains everything in easy to understand terms. Chances are if somebody has been to a techie review site and they don't understand a lot of that stuff, if they see my listing, there's a pretty good chance that they would want to click on something like that to at least see if it is something that they can understand. So once again, I'm going for um, appealing there with my description. Forgotten to add that to the social networks listing. So my info page is actually now finished. You can see I have my content, but then down at the bottom, it says nothing found. Apologies, no results were found. This is because I have not created any posts yet. Well, I will be proceeding on and adding in a post to that in just a moment here. For now though, um, I wanna go on to the next category page very briefly here. This is gonna be my product category page. I will be coming back to this page in uh, next week's class because the main focus for that class is actually going to be um, this page here and getting all the product posts set up. For now though, I do just want some placeholder content I'm not going to set up the, um, the actual page with post template section yet. I guess I can't even change the template itself or it's going to list the nothing found at the bottom. So for now, I'm just going to leave it like this. So I just have a standard short article to go along with my title. And next week, we're going to be coming back in and adding all of our uh, product post to this section of our site. For this week though, our main focus is to get all of our informational content finished up. So I do want to show you how to create an informational post. Everything we've been doing so far has been done in the pages section of WordPress. With the exception of these main pages though, my home page, my main category pages, and my about page, everything else that I'm gonna create on this site will be done as a post. So now I'm gonna go to post 
and add new. What I'm going to be doing now is adding in informational articles to my site. This again is based off of my site planning. Once again, what makes it really useful to have this listing so you know what to write articles for, what those articles should be about. And then when you're putting your site together, you know, you know what you need to actually add into your site still or not. Another reason this can be useful, though, is for organization. What I mean by that is when I create a new post on my site and I publish it, it's going to automatically show up on my main category page for me. Well, the most recent post that I have created will be up at the top of the list, whereas the oldest post that I created is it going to be at the bottom of the list. This is important to you as the website builder because content that you have higher up on the page can be given more weight in a search engine size. So particular topics that I have in my list here, the ones that I found based on my keyword research that had the most traffic available for it and yet the lowest competition showing up on search engines, those would probably be the phrases and the pages that I would consider to be most important on the site because I need those pages to get the rankings to bring in traffic to everything else going on on this site. So certain phrases like Windows slow boot, I believe was one of them in particular. Um, stuff like uh, the gaming phrases, the defrag phrase, um, maybe even the PCI card phrase. There were a number of these phrases in here that compared to the other ones, and especially compared to my product keywords, they had significantly more traffic with less competition. And so I would want to keep those pages to be the last pages that I publish in that section of my website. So I might publish the more general kind of information first and have that end up further down my page, where then the, um, the articles that I really, really want to have a ranking for I'll leave those up at the top of my info pages. So I will publish those last. So this can be important for your organization once again to know what to create first, which articles to write first, which ones to publish on your website first, and then which ones to proceed on with. So what I try to do when I am writing out my own articles for my info pages, is to do it just like I've been doing for the other pages here, except I have a slightly different approach to it because in a lot of cases, I want more content to be on my info page compared with other pages of my site. So to start with, before I actually begin my writing, I'll open up my notepad and start out by giving a title to my page, which contains my primary keyword in it. Beyond that, though, I want to kind of have a mental picture of what I'm going to write about throughout my content. So I will try to brainstorm three to five subtopics for my main topic, whatever this article is about, whatever the primary keyword phrase is. I want three to five subtopics for that main topic. And that's what I will write my content about. So I'll start out with a title just like this. And then I'll write what my main topics are. What is defrag? My other ones, I think I did, yeah, HDD and SDD or SSD. Um, defrag hard disk drive and defrag 
solid state drive. So here's three topics, subtopics, having to do with my main topic. And then what I can do is write out information having to do with each of these different subtopics. So I first start and give a summary and an introduction of my entire page topic. So that would be my initial content right up here at the top of my page before I get into one of these subtopics here. Then for each of my subtopics, I expand on those with a number of paragraphs of text, however much I may need to truly be able to talk about that subject. It's quite okay. For this one, I used three paragraphs. Uh, for this one, I was using five. For the one down here at the bottom, I have numerous paragraphs of text, a couple at the top, a couple down at the bottom, and I even have a numbered list that is going to be in the middle of it all. These are my large descriptions for each of my subtopics here. So I have my header, and then I have my big description to go along with it. Now, ultimately, you should have three goals when it comes to these info pages. Number one is to teach your website readers about the subject. So you want useful content. Number two is to get traffic. Using the higher traffic, lower competition phrases that are often more informational based you can bring in the traffic off of the search engines to these pages of your site. And then number three, you want people to proceed from these landing pages of your site to the money pages of your site, the places where you can actually earn something. So these will be the product pages. With that said, since a higher competition niche where you have to target the info phrases. Since you're going to be getting the traffic onto those info pages, you need to move that traffic from your info pages to your product pages. And so that's what this last step is, funnel content towards a product page. This is actually pretty easy to do if you have picked out your topics correctly to the point where anything relating to your subject can be led to purchasing that product. So that's essentially what you want to try to go for with your info pages is ultimately you need them to leave one of your info pages and to proceed on to one of your product pages to buy something. So for defrag solid state drive, all the way down at the bottom of my page, I say take a look at our recommended solid state drive brands here for help on picking one that is right for you. And what I'll actually do is turn the phrase solid state drive brands into a clickable link, which will then point to the brands section of my site. Well, you can do this in a more general manner, like what you see here, where I would link up to my main category page for my products. But then you can also get more specific with it, where um, here's another article of mine for this site for uh, the gaming, where down at the bottom I talk about personally I use the Samsung 850 Pro solid state drive. I can actually turn this right here, Samsung 850 Pro SSD, into a clickable link that then goes to the Samsung brand page of my website. So you're not only funneling traffic that's going to come into the info pages along to these product pages, but this also has search engine benefits too you're re-emphasizing what those target pages are about with your anchor text that you use. 
and that can actually help to boost the search rankings on some of your higher competition pages. For this site, my brand names and the actual product phrases, a phrase like this is gonna have crazy high competition. I may not ever be able to get a ranking for these, these phrases. However, there's certainly no harm in trying. I need the info pages there for the traffic. I need the product pages there to refer sales and I need to pass people along from the info pages to the product pages. So I'm gonna need those links anyways. Why not use relevant keyword phrases to help reemphasize the point of my brand pages? That can once again help me to get rankings on that brand page for specific keywords like this one. When you're dealing with higher competition, it can be hit and miss. However, uh, if you make a habit of doing this type of stuff, it has benefits all over the board for it. So it will help you out one way or another, whether it's funneling the traffic for you, helping to boost your search rankings, or even a combination of all of these. Now, when you are building your post onto your site, this will work pretty similar to how it has worked for the other pages I have shown you so far today. The main difference being that you're going to be creating posts here and no longer pages. The other main difference though is that you have categories that you actually need to select when you are dealing with a post. So this is how you sort your content to ensure it shows up on the correct part of your website. So I just click on the info box here and it'll show up in the info section of my site. If I click on the brand box, it'll show up in the brand section of my site. You can have a post in multiple categories and it will show up on both sections of your site. However, I would really recommend against doing that unless you have a very good reason for doing so because that can essentially end up being duplicate content. The title, the picture, the excerpt of this page will be on both of the category pages that you end up selecting. So that's kind of why I would recommend just sticking with a single one. Now, just like you did with the other pages, you wanna try to spice it up a little bit, add things like your headers, make them bold uh, for this particular post. I have a list here. I'm going to make the um, the intro word for each of these items bolded so they stand out a little bit more. But in terms of making them into an actual list, I will use WordPress's capabilities. Where I select the entire list, I click on either UL or OL. This is unordered and this is ordered. So if you want it numbered, you use the O. If you don't want it numbered, you use the U. And then for each individual line of that list, you select it and click on the LI button. And that makes it a line in that list. So I can do something like this for my list to make it uh, stand out from the rest of my content a little bit better. Now, beyond this initial tidying up of your content and the other default things that I've been talking to you about that you wanna do on all of your pages, like setting up your SEO settings, the main thing that you really need to worry about with your post is actually setting a featured image for it. What I mean by featured image is you have your normal 
media that you can add to a post. Where you go and you upload a file here, you can also access your media library as normal and insert images into your post. Well, down here in the bottom right hand corner of a post, you have this set featured image link. This opens up the same kind of a screen where you could then upload an image or access one of your existing images. But instead of inserting the image into your post, you select one and you set it as the featured image. Now, this doesn't add any code to your actual page itself, but you can see right here, my featured image is showing up in this little preview. And this featured image will actually also get used in a couple of other places. I wanna go ahead and publish this post so you can see what I'm talking about here. Number one, our featured image is automatically used by the Weaver theme and it is shown in the top left corner of our post content. If I were to click on this, it would automatically take me to the full size of the image. Notice how the full size of the image on this example here, where it's a lot longer, wider than it is tall. Well, when you get the preview of it, the thumbnail, it will cut that off if the dimensions are not exactly square. So keep that in mind with whatever you decide to choose as your featured image. It'll not only show up on this page like that, but if you go to the primary category page, that featured image also shows up there. So this is the page I was on before where it said nothing was found at the bottom. I have not updated this page whatsoever since that time, but now it is actually showing more information down here for this post that I just created. So people can now go down here and click on the image, the continue reading link, or on the title itself and get to that actual post on my site. So as far as the thumbnail here and the dimensions of it getting changed on you and cut off, there's not really a lot you can do about it on the main category page. It's gonna be shown as this small square thumbnail like this. However, on an individual page, if you wanted to change how that featured image was actually used, if you go down to the Weaver Extreme Options, down at the bottom you have a section that says Single Page View Featured Image. You can change how this is going to get displayed. So you can have it shown in different sections or you can even have it hidden entirely. So for my example, if I didn't want it to be showing a tiny little thumbnail up in the top left, I could hide it on my page like this and then actually go up to the top and manually insert it into my page. But instead of using a square 150 by 150 thumbnail, I could use one that's gonna be more relevant to the dimensions of that actual picture. So I could go full size maybe, or even the medium size Making a change like this will simply allow you to show the entire picture instead of a cropped thumbnail of it. Now it looks like for this image, like it might work out a little bit better if I just show the full picture. 
I can even remove the link entirely that it's pointing to. So now at the top of this page, I just have a larger image and it's not clickable at all. It doesn't go to anything. Obviously this uh, definitely ties into what the rest of my content is about too. So you can mess with these featured images a little bit using this setting here. If you don't like the way it is getting displayed by default on this actual post, if you wanted to keep the default method though, but maybe you wanted to change the link, a really good example of this would be on your product pages. On your product pages, you will have a picture of your product that you set as the featured image. So then on your product category page, it can show a little preview of each of those products all listed together. Well, that thumbnail on the product page, you wouldn't want it really linking up to a full size version of that image. You'd really want it pointing over to Amazon. So you can do stuff like put in an Amazon affiliate link in your featured image URL box right here. And that will actually change the featured image preview, the one, the, uh, one that was showing up in the top left of this post here before I disabled it. You can change it to any kind of a URL that you want to. So while I recommend using the featured image for any post that you create on this type of a website, you may or may not want to use it the default way. It just kind of depends on what your pictures are and what the dimensions of your pictures may be. If they all work out fine showing as a little square thumbnail, then you know, power to you. Leave the featured image preview there and save yourself a little bit of work. You don't have to go through and change this type of stuff, but this is something that may be needed for some and not for others. I would also want to still be paying attention to my SEO settings, my search engine listing and social networks listing tabs to provide the title and the description. But one of the more important things that I wanted to point out that is different with this type of a uh, post creation than it is with the other pages I've been showing you so far tonight is the excerpt. If you look at my primary page, my category page here, where it is showing the title and the preview and the description to go along with it, this description right here is coming from my page content. That's actually the beginning of my page content right here. Well, there are a number of different ways that you can have that excerpt actually created. You can do just like it's doing here where I have a blank excerpt and it will then automatically generate one based on the top text that is in my content. However, it won't always work out to your best advantage to do that. There are a lot of cases where simply providing a couple of extra sentences of content that essentially summarize your entire page can make it more appealing to click on when it's being viewed on your main category page like this. Here, somebody does get, you know, the intro content for this page, but then it's basically just cut off on them. And sometimes it can make them want to continue on reading by simply getting a little preview of the post like this. Other times, though, I like to be able to summarize it myself and, um, you know, talk them into clicking on it for a specific reason, some kind of content I might have contained 
on that page, kind of like what I would do with the meta description that I set up for any given page. So with that said, you can use the default auto-generated descriptions that are gonna come off of the page content, or you can provide your own excerpt. It will give you a little more SEO value to provide a unique summary for the excerpt here than it will be to just have the auto-generated content. Because if you remember on this primary category page, this is really the only content we wrote for this page. So we're depending on a lot of this content to really take up the entire page, to give us all of our content for this page. So with that said, if you don't write out your own excerpt, this is just gonna be a copy of content from somewhere else on your site. This is what's known as duplicate content here. When it comes from another page of your uh, website. So it's not, against SEO rules to have a setup like this where this content is found on this page word for word. But again, you will get more SEO benefit if you can make this unique to where this content is not found on the actual page that you click through. And that's done once again by providing a excerpt. Now, if you are on a post like this and you scroll down to the bottom and you do not see this excerpt box right here, you may need to go up to the top and look at the screen options. If you click on this, you have a number of different sections that you can have displayed on the post editor and you can change what actually gets displayed by just clicking on the checkboxes. So look for excerpt and just click on the checkbox and then you can go back down below and it'll automatically be showing up there for you. By default though, I'm, I'm wanting to say that this is actually hidden by default, so I'm pretty sure you will need to uh, change these screen options to get it to show. There's some other things here, though, that you may not have previously been aware of as being part of the editor or part of WordPress. Things like the full height editor, you know, if there's certain things that you don't want there, you can remove those to give yourself a more uh, clutter-free work environment. Now, if you are using the automatic previews or the uh, automatic excerpt generation here. You also have to think about the limit, uh, the word limit that this excerpt is going to generate. The theme is actually controlling that limit. If you go to appearance and theme options, then go to main options, post specifics, and finally click on excerpts and full posts right here. You'll see a little section that has to do with the excerpts where you can actually change what is really happening. You can change the continue reading link. You see continue reading text is showing up with each of my posts, it will continue to do so as I add more posts to this particular page here. If I didn't want it to say continue reading, if I wanted it to say read more, read more about solid state drives, you know, whatever the case may be, I can change that default text. The excerpt link though, right here, changes how many words will actually be generated for this. Now, by default, this is going to be set to 40. And with the thumbnail size that you have here, 40 words, if you have it taking up the entire width of the page, so that would be the one column, 40 words really only takes up about two lines, maybe two and a half lines worth of this. So that's about 40 words somewhere in that neighborhood. So I usually double it to about 80. That pushes me a lot closer to taking up all of my available space here, just so I don't have a lot of white space 
next to these pictures for each of my post listings. So if you need to adjust that a little higher or lower to kind of fit uh, the content that you're writing with the pictures that you're selecting, I uh, just simply know that that is there. And I generally do change that myself from 40. You can see right here, default 40 words, and I change that up to 80. And this brings me to the final step of today's lesson. Sorry about that. Which is to set up my menu and also to enable search engine indexing. At the very least, before you do these steps, especially the enabling the search engine indexing part, try to have at a bare minimum the content that you see on my site right now. I have my home page, my about page, my main category pages with content, and I have one info page at least to go along with it. So this gives the main pages of your site here, the ones you're gonna be linking up to, it gives them some kind of a content for search engines to actually index. So they don't think it's a blank page. That should be the bare minimum that you have before you enable indexing. Some people do like to wait until their site is completely done and then they'll enable it. I like to do it a little early to give people uh, search engines the chance to index my site before it is completed. That way it can see that I'm adding content to my site, that that content is being added in a natural kind of a time frame instead of just one day the site doesn't exist and the next day the site exists and it's got 20 pages worth of content on it. So I try to make it more natural appearing. And this is how you can accomplish that by getting to this point, getting these four or five pages of initial content created, then go ahead and enabling the search engine indexing. The other thing though that I want to do before I'm actually going to proceed with enabling the search indexing is to create a menu for my page. If you go to appearance and menus, I just like calling mine either top or top menu. And this is basically just gonna be a replacement for what I have up at the top of my screen here now for my menu. Basically though, it's still gonna be the same. The only reason I really have any desire to create this custom menu as opposed to using what's already generated by default here is just so I can tidy up the text that is there and also so I can make it say text when I hover over any one of these items. So for example, I have my main pages here that I've already created, one being the home page, two being category pages, and the last being an about page. So I actually want all four of these pages to be in my menu just like I currently have. So right now, this is basically what my default menu is already set up as. For this page here, this is my home page. Obviously, I will want this to be at the beginning of my list. I usually put the about page down at the end, and then I'll have my category pages in the middle. So instead of saying how to make your computer faster with SSD, where I have this long navigation label. I basically just want to shorten this to make it easier to read
and to also make people aware of what this section of my site's really going to be about. This one's not too bad, SSD brands. If I did find myself repeating a phrase or a word like SSD over and over again, I might remove it. And I have plenty of sites where I'll have a brand section. And instead of saying what the product is followed by brands, I'll just have brands as my navigation label. I do use uh, both of them, actually, though. So the main thing here is you're just tidying up your menu and you're rearranging where things are going to be in your menu. Now, what you actually do to get this to replace your default menu is clicking this primary navigation checkbox. You can see right here, I've specified used instead of default menu. So I save my menu now. If I go back and refresh my site, you can see my menu is now changed. Still the same thing, still the same links. It is just cleaned up a little bit now to make it easier to digest at a quick glance so people know what part of my site they want to go and check out. So that brings me to the next step, which is to now enable search engine indexing. Using SEO Ultimate, you will get this little notice at the top, and you can just click on this. You can also go to Settings and Reading to get to the same page, where we simply enable search engines to index our website now. Now once that is done, the last thing you really have is Google Webmaster Tools, where initially when we set this up and we prevented search engines from indexing our site, we couldn't exactly have it all completed in the Google Webmaster Tools area because of that prevention of the indexing. If you look right here, speedy SSD, check my severe health issues for my site. The one thing that's really showing up is talking about robots blocking important pages. Well, with this one thing corrected now, um, I should be all set to go. It may not initially, like back on this main page, how I have enabled it, and it's still showing up here. These are kind of little notices you can see. This one is older. This one's from today. So just because it shows up here doesn't necessarily mean that it's accurate. What you really want to go and do, though, is just go back to your site maps. Go into your site click into your sitemaps and you can either remove what you already have here or you can just click on it right here and click on resubmit and refresh the page. Now I still have my error showing up but that's just because it's still pending. It's going to have to reprocess this again but now that I have enabled search engine indexing on my website, all this will then clear up and Google Webmaster Tools can actually start tracking all of my data for me. And again, that data is something that I will come back to at the end of this series to analyze. Now, just to explain real quickly, your overall goal now for the next week's worth of work should be focusing on writing your content and getting it published into your site. Basically everything except for your product pages. And again, there will be a checklist guide for walking you guys through this available uh, tomorrow evening.